This morning, we are going to talk about cognitive enhancement, which is one of the most popular topics in neuroethics. Um, you know, a lot of media coverage of it, a lot of interest just, you know, among, among your students, among your relatives at Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, people, people are interested in this idea that we might be able to increase our cognitive abilities in some safe way. Um, the lecture today is going to have those parts, um, and we will start, naturally enough, with just defining what a cognitive enhancer is. Now, this might seem a little obvious, but there's some confusion, in fact, um, just with the terminology, between uses of drugs that, uh, drugs or other methods, including non-invasive brain stimulation, which you'll hear about next, um, the use of these methods to increase the cognitive abilities of someone with um, a dementing illness, uh, um, an, an inborn, uh, um, you know, intellectual disability, uh, you know, head injury patient, whatever, um, treating essentially treating cognitive disability, which is sometimes called cognitive enhancement, and what I'm going to define for the purposes of today's discussion as cognitive enhancement, namely taking a normal, healthy person with normal cognitive abilities and making them even better. Okay. So the term was, um, is attributed to um, this Romanian psychopharmacologist, Georgia, I guess is how you would pronounce his name. Um, who said, man is not going to wait passively for millions of years before evolution offers him a better brain. Um, so that is the, you know, essentially the sort of audacious um, demand uh, that um, motivates people to, to look for cognitive enhancers, to use uh, cognitive enhancers. Um, and uh, um, well, leave, leave it there for now. Um, it's worth pointing out at this point that most, I think you, I can pretty safely say all, um, virtually all, drugs that are used now for cognitive enhancement were initially developed for the treatment of some sort of disorder. Um, that's just a fact about the way the drug development pipeline works. Um, it's kind of, if for no other reason, it's just not profitable, um, you know, right now for companies to um, uh, invest in looking to enhance cognition. They're better off looking to treat disorders and then, you know, maybe, um, uh, maybe there can be some off-label use for, for cognitive enhancement in normal subjects. That may change, however, and we'll talk about the, the possible um, opening for um, kind of avowed, frank, you know, development of cognitive enhancers um, towards the end. So um, let's talk about which drugs have cognitive enhancing potential. Well. Essentially, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long, long list, um, including prescription drugs, including over-the-counter drugs, and including things that most people wouldn't even classify as drugs, you know, nutritional supplements. Um, Morgenthaler and Dean wrote a book called Smart Drugs um, a couple of decades ago. They came out with Smart Drugs Second Edition more recently. Um, they have a very comprehensive list of things that you have never heard of that somebody somewhere has claimed enhanced cognition. Um, so uh, most of these are kind of niche uh, drugs with niche followings um, and very little is known about their um, usefulness as cognitive enhancers. But if you, if you look at what we do have some evidence of use, usefulness on, there are basically three categories of drugs. One is the stimulants that are used primarily to treat ADHD. Um, amphetamine, you know, most common brand name now is Adderall. 
and methylphenidate, you know, Ritalin, Concerta. Um, there is a, a, a fair amount of research on the effects of these drugs in normal healthy subjects. Now, some, some of that research is just, you know, giving it to control subjects in a study on ADHD. Some of that research is not for the sake of understanding whether it's a cognitive enhancer or not, but rather for the sake of using the drug as a probe to do basic research on the neurochemistry of cognition. Um, and we will come back to the question of what this research has shown um, and some, I think, changes in the view of the field um, about the effectiveness, you know, based on this research uh, in a minute. But first, let me just briefly mention there are Alzheimer's drugs, um, primarily um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like, um, oh God, I need my uh, Aricept. Aricept. Thank you. I need my Aricept. I can't remember that. Okay. Um, and uh, also the drug modafinil. Some of you may have heard of this. It's um, very popular now among you know striving uh, professionals who want to pack more work into a work week. Um, this is, I'll tell you a little bit about this because I think it's not as well known as um, the ADHD and Alzheimer's drugs. It's a drug that was developed originally for the treatment of narcolepsy, sort of uncontrollable falling asleep in the middle of your day, which obviously is very dangerous as well as um, a big you know, quality of life killer. Um, it's now approved for that and a couple of other things. Um, but it is prescribed off-label for a huge number of things. Um, I am told it's considered pretty safe. Um, uh, it basically makes people with narcolepsy stay awake and feel alert during the day. For normal folk, it lets you be awake and alert even if you are quite sleep deprived. So you can go you know, all night long and through the next day on this, feeling pretty good considering that you haven't slept, and showing pretty well-preserved cognitive abilities. So for this reason, it's of interest to everybody from, uh, you know, the military uh, who need to have their, you know, pilots on long haul, you know, uh, reconnaissance missions, whatever, um, awake and alert, to um, hospital house staff. And there have been some studies, some published studies now on exactly that population, showing that their cognitive abilities, their decision-making abilities are better preserved after they've had um, modafinil. So um, there are also some studies that suggest that even if you are well-rested, modafinil may improve your cognition. Um, certain kind of executive function inhibitory control tasks seem to be enhanced by modafinil. So th those are the, the main options on the table. Um, I can tell you that uh, most of them, uh, or most, most people seeking cognitive enhancement in the world today are using the ADHD drugs. They're using stimulants, partly because they're just easier to get hold of. Um, a lot of students on college campuses with prescriptions who don't <coughs> necessarily want to take all of their pills and they can make money selling them. Um, and just pretty, pretty easy in general to get a prescription from a physician if you go in complaining of the symptoms of ADHD. Um, okay, how might the stimulants work? Why, why do they um, purportedly enhance cognition? Well, let's talk about, uh, em well, focusing on amphetamine and methylphenidate, um, which are the, by far the, the most common drugs in these category. Um, how do they affect cognition? Well, they um, increase the activity of dopamine, um, particularly in the basal ganglia and prefrontal cortex. Just very vague, as Stephen Moore said, you know, sort of, outrageously superficial treatment of this, or what did he say? Revoltingly superficial, I don't know. Anyway, um, 
the point is that um, they increase um, dopamine and norepinephrine um, in parts of the brain that are associated with executive function, attention, cognitive control, working memory, all those good things that go into intelligent behavior. Um, they do so by slightly different mechanisms, um, by either you know sort of um, pushing out more um, uh, uh, catecholamines from the vesicles, or by blocking reuptake of them. But the effect is the same. There, there are more of those neurotransmitters in the synapse um, ready to do their work. And there is some published literature, as I said, um, on normal, healthy subjects um, showing that these things. Uh, seem to improve cognition. Here's one of the more impressive findings. This is a study of learning and memory enhancement um, from Breitenstein. Um, he gave people, as you can see, amphetamine or placebo, and he had them do a continuous learning task, kept presenting them with, um, I believe these were like artificial he, he was teaching them an artificial language, so they were trying to learn made up words, made up vocabulary words. And you can see that, you know, in the beginning, not surprisingly, no difference between the conditions, but every learning trial, um, the uh, amphetamine people do better. Um, what's really interesting is that way out here at one year transfer, a year later when he tests them. Now, the drug has long since left their system now, right? The, um, the group that learned the material while on amphetamine retains more than the group that learned the uh, material while on placebo. So Patty is looking at this with a squinty eye. Um, I, I have to say, as I'll get to two slides from now, there is a lot of kind of reassessment going on of this literature. Is, is that for real? I don't know. Um, let's, let's, let's hold that thought for a minute because uh, I will come back to it. I think it's a very important point. But certainly on the face of things, um, there seems to be a, a pretty, pretty sizable, I mean, that's a big gap compared to those error bars, right? Pretty sizable effect of, um, of the drug. It's worth mentioning that the effect of the drug may depend a lot on who you are. So um, here is some data from um, uh, Mate, uh, VS Mate from NIMH, showing the effect of, again, amphetamine, uh, amphetamine versus placebo on Wisconsin card sort performance in normal healthy subjects. Um, and note that what's being plotted here is um, the uh, uh, errors. Okay, So better performance is lower on this graph. And the different lines are from people with different genotypes, specifically people with different versions of the COMT gene, which affects dopamine activity, in fact, particularly in frontal cortex. And what you can see is that the Val Vals, the people who are homozygous for Val, um, are worse, they're worst on placebo. But on the drug, they actually get better. Their errors go down a lot. No, everybody else is you know, not, not really noticeably affected. If anything, you might see a little trend for the Met Mets, who would normally be expected to do best, and who are clearly you know, not significantly best here. They get a little worse. They start making some more errors. That's a pattern that's been seen um, in, in more than just this one study. Namely, the people who benefit the most tend to be the people who are doing the worst at baseline, and um, also uh, the people who have the, um, the quote-unquote better um, allele of COMT are more likely to be harmed, and the people who have the worse allele are more likely to, to benefit. So whatever we conclude <clears throat> about these drugs, 
the conclusion has to take into account who you are, your, your abilities, your biology, um, and so forth. So now let's get to this question, this sticky question of the robustness of these effects. As you probably know, there is a real um, crisis in uh, cognitive psychology, social psychology, brain imaging research about replicability now. Um, people uh, are suddenly realizing they've been a little naive about you know, how to interpret the results of small studies that, you know, small underpowered studies that get published and nobody bothers to replicate them or frankly, they may try to replicate them and not be able to do so and figure, oh, I must have done something wrong, who knows, you know. Um, this is not a claim that researchers have been dishonest or disingenuous or, or any, done anything bad intentionally. It's a claim that researchers, I think, have been a little naive about um, believing the robustness of their own underpowered studies. Because if you're underpowered, what that means is, you know, your experiment is a lot more like flipping a coin. And when you're flipping coins, sometimes you get, you know, interesting results and so, by chance alone, right? Um, I think there's reason to believe that the cognitive enhancement literature is suffering from this. Um, my graduate student, Irena Ilyeva, um, has just finished a meta-analysis, it's not out there yet, um, where she meta-analyzed um, the uh, work on stimulant effects, you know, basically amphetamine and uh, methylphenidate, on executive functions and learning and memory. Um, and what she found is, um, <clears throat> for executive functions, small effects, there are real effects there, but they are very small. I mean, they are standardized effect sizes, you know, around 0.1, sometimes 0.2 on a good day kind of thing, you know, depending on the particular executive function being studied. When she looked at the learning and memory results, and especially the long-term effects, like that very impressive one I showed you, and plotted them on a funnel plot, which I'm sure Rachel won knows all about. Some of you also may be familiar with funnel plots. Funnel plots array the data points from different studies in two dimensions, one of which is the size of the effect they found, and the other one of which is uh, essentially the sensitivity or the power of the study. Okay. You, know, you can think of it just roughly speaking as like the sample size. So what you would expect is that the bigger the sample size, the more um, tightly clustered the effect size estimated by the studies will be. And as you go down in sample size or down in power, the more broadly arrayed they're going to be. And that's, that's actually what you see. It's nice. Um, but if you, if the literature that you're looking at, that you're plotting on this funnel plot, has suffered from publication bias, where a lot of the literature is from weak, underpowered studies that just by dumb luck happen to show significant effects, okay? The only way you can get a significant effect with a very underpowered study is if the effect is really big, right? So you're going to have, in that case, a skew. The funnel will not be symmetrical. You will have, oh, I guess I'm, I'm drawing this in the direction that it makes sense for me. Let me turn around. You are going to have um, the big effects out here in the, um, sorry, OK. Up this way is, let's just say sample size, you know, power. Out this way is effect size. Um, if you are, if you have a literature that has a lot of underpowered studies that by chance happen to have been significant, what that means is you're going to have a lot of studies published where by chance you got a big effect size, 
um, there were, that tells you that there must have been other studies down here that just didn't get published because they came out null. Um, and then, as you increase the power of your design going up, the effect size increasingly um, converges on the true effect size. So you get a graph that is skewed this way rather than a nice symmetrical funnel. I hope that was clear. Anyway, with the long-term memory studies, that's exactly what you see. So probably we are overestimating, again, not due to anybody faking anything, just due to you know, perhaps a certain naivete, wishful thinking about how small a sample you can get away with, and you know, the, the fact that our journals, our journal editors, won't publish null results, right? So, um, so we can now say, look, these, these drugs, even if we think they are useful for some people, they're not useful for others, they may actually interfere with some. Um, and just looking at the literature, you may be overestimating the, the, the positive effects that you see. Okay, so um, that's just um, basically what I just said. Now, there are um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the other drugs that I mentioned, systematic reviews of methylphenidate uh, alone, of um, modafinil, of the uh, Alzheimer's drugs, um, that show little or no effect on normal cognition. And a recent meta-analysis on modafinil that showed like zero, 0, 0.00 effect on cognition in rested people still be very useful if you're trying to crank out a lot of work, right? Um, so I think we are seeing the pendulum swing back from sort of, you know, excited predictions that we're all going to be smarter in the future. We'll just, you know, take our customized, you know, regimen of cognitive enhancing drugs and uh, grow our minds to mm -hmm, maybe, maybe it's not so useful. Yes, Eric. We need to make a distinction between cognition and attention or something. When our college, when our college students use amphetamines, presumably successfully, yeah. you're telling us they're not getting any cognitive Perfect. Perfect segue. So how do we explain the persisting use of these drugs by people, right? Like what, what are they, uh, they must be getting something out of them, you would think. Um, now Eric is suggesting maybe we should draw a line between cognition as measured by, you know, working memory tasks, uh, you know, inhibitory control, you know, flanker, stroop, um, learning nonsense syllables, that sort of thing, and more real world tests of cognitive performance where you're saying attention might be more, more useful. Um, attention is one of those words that you know is so hard to define and dangerous to use because people interpret it different ways. But if by attention you mean kind of the ability to persist, to sort of get up and do the thing and not be distracted, I, I think you're probably right. And um, here is some evidence uh, that you might be just right. Scott is a sociologist. Um, who was very interested in this, you know, uh, idea that people were starting to enhance themselves cognitively, particularly interested in the idea that they were doing so by manipulating their brains. Um, and his methods, um, you know, coming from his background, are what's called qualitative research. And I have to say, I had never really thought much about qualitative research before learning about this, but it's, it's, very, it's very interesting, especially in these areas where, you know, the, there isn't a sort of well-established structure of, you know, sort of framework for framing hypotheses, and, um, you know, basically you don't even know the lay of the land. And I think when you're in a field like that, it's very useful to just go in with an open mind and say, you know, tell me what you think. Tell me how these drugs affect you. Um, so I'm going to just read you a couple of excerpts from his interviews. 
Troy. I'll wake up in the morning, go get breakfast at the dining hall, and try to fill up as much as possible, because later I'm not going to be, I won't think about food. I'll just forget, you know, because these stimulants are appetite suppressants. Then I'll go straight to the library, and I'll take the pill on the way. When I get there, I set myself up and just open my book, and I'll sort of start reading a little. And then pretty much all of a sudden, I'll find myself really reading, just on it. So what's that like, Scott asks. Well, I'm looking at it, and I'll find myself, it feels like I'm reading it just one word after another. And not like super fast, but really steadily. My eyes never leave the page. And that continues through the day. Um, I'll read, I'll make notes, I'll keep checking things over, making sure I've got everything, and it's like that till I'm done. So this really is kind of, I think, what Eric, you know, might have been saying when he said attention. And it's not necessarily particularly cognitive, right? It sounds more, you know, energy, motivation, um, perhaps confidence. Um, there's another nice... Uh, remember what page it was on. Okay, Sarah. Everything seems better and more doable. Sometimes, a lot of the time actually, I'm feeling kind of, it's hard to do anything. When I'm walking to the library, I'll think, if I didn't have Adderall, there's no way I'd get anything done. I'd just sit there in front of my computer and not be doing anything at all. Nothing at all, Scott says. Yeah, I mean, even just getting to the library can be difficult. I just, it's like the last place I want to be. It's like, there just is no way, not this again. <laughs> it makes me feel like shutting down just thinking about it. Like, I just can't, even if it's in the morning, I feel like I need to go back to sleep. So that, I think, makes it even more clear that these are non-cognitive effects that people are getting. They're, they're mood elevating, they're energizing, uh, confidence building. In fact, they're all the effects that, uh, for those of you who remember, you know, the bad old days of the 50s and 60s with physicians writing prescriptions for amphetamine, you know, to like lift the moods of frustrated housewives and, you know, mildly depressed, uh, you know, office workers and so forth. This is, um, this, this is mood engineering. This is not really cognitive enhancement. And yet, of course, it results in greater success, more productivity with cognitively demanding tasks, particularly tasks that are, that are boring or aversive for some other reason, okay? Um, so I, I think there is probably good reason to um, suspect that the, the non-cognitive effects of these drugs are largely responsible for their popularity as cognitive, you know, as study aids among college students. Yeah, Patty. Uh, I just wanted to bring up the issue of, I don't know, a placebo effect, especially in these subjective, qualitative experiences. Yes. No, that's, that's a good idea. Could the, I mean, that's a good question. Could this be a placebo effect? Absolutely can't tell from a study like this. Um, so let me say that uh, there are studies that have been done, placebo-controlled studies, where amphetamine does raise people's mood, um, you know, give them more energy, vim and vigor, et cetera. Um, so prob of course, you know, you could say, mm, and how well-powered were those studies? I, I don't know. Um, Irena Ilieva and I, um, I'll just go back one slide, um, did a, a study that was um, mountains and mountains of null results. And we, you know, basically it was a double blind crossover placebo controlled test of Adderall versus, you know, placebo on many different cognitive tasks, um, laboratory cognitive tasks, SATs you know, standardized tests, Raven's progressive matrices, and nothing showed an effect except for one item. The item was, do you think this pill that you took today enhanced your cognitive performance? 
and people were more likely to say yes on Adderall than placebo. So that's obviously not a placebo effect because, you know, that was a contrast between Adderall and placebo. And that was but first time users? Yes, they were first time users. Then they one, one concern about thinking about these effects is that people who use it regularly, like these students who were interviewed in the study you just read from, they get a certain de dependence on the drug and, and maybe they think it's beneficial to them because they, she said, you can't imagine what it would be like not to have it. Yeah. The symptoms of withdrawal would be what you're trying to avoid. So you're, you're no longer getting the benefit, but you know that if you don't take it, you would get a decrement. Yeah, yeah, okay, so the, the question is, you know, perhaps if, if we're looking at um, habitual users here, um, they, they would actually be noting the negative effects of not having it when they're in the placebo condition. Um, well, in this study, that was not an issue. These people were, you know, squeaky clean, um, didn't use any drugs. Um, we did, you know, urine tests and everything to, to verify that. Um, uh, Another thing, I mean, we're gonna to get to the safety issues very shortly, um, but I just wanna say that um, this, this idea that you would start to feel worse than normal by not taking it, I mean, this is essentially what you see as you develop a dependence on a drug, that's, that's a danger with these drugs. It's less of a danger, I think, for people using them for cognitive enhancement just because the use tends to be much more intermittent. But I certainly think that there is a kind of a psychological dependence that's possible. Um, you know, this young woman, Sarah, saying, you know, I'd, I'd be lost without it. Well, that's bad. I mean, if you reach young, you know, if you reach adulthood, kind of never having taken on a demanding work project without a certain drug, I mean, what, what does that do to your, to your own thinking about your ability to get work done, you know, on your own. Yeah, it's a lot of, I'll tell you what, let me, what, what time do we end? 11, oh, we've got a ton of time. So let me, unless it's a question of clarification, let me power through, because we are pretty close to done with these slides. Um, okay, so now, uh, speaking of students using these, I mean, who is using these? What's the epidemiology? Um, Who's using where, why? Well, the biggest and best study we have um, of non-medical use, which is kind of the buzzword for like you're, you're not using it because a doctor prescribed it for you for some medical condition. The biggest study we have was published in 2005 using data from 2001, so we're talking 12 years ago now, and Certainly, you know, one's impression talking to people, you know, in the field, on the ground, is that these, these practices have become more common. But back then, in 2001, um, surveying almost 11,000 college students was a good, you know, the, the kind of sample that an epidemiologist would like. You know, it was stratified, representative, all those good things. Um, they found the lifetime prevalence of students having used one of these drugs non-medically was 7%. For, you know, for the whole country, that's a lot of kids. Um, on specific campuses, the rate ranged from zero to 25%. Um, so there's a lot of variability. Um, some campuses are full of these things. Others, you know, people are really not interested in using them. Now, um, my guess is that on some campuses, if you're asking, you know, have, have you tried this once? Have you used this in the last year? Um, some places, the, the, the number would be a lot higher than that. Is yeah. there any evidence that the uh, Ivy College, Ivy College use more? Yes, question, do the Ivy League colleges use more? Um, yeah, in fact, this, this study uh, looked at various uh, characteristics of the individual students and of the institutions that they were at. And the more competitive elite colleges had a higher rate of use. Uh, the colleges on the coasts had a higher rate of use. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Okay, what about non-students? Well, oh, sorry, 
I'm, I'm not ready to move to the next slide. Okay, so why are they using these drugs? What methods are they using? What frequencies? There is research on these things, but um, nothing, nothing that really, I would say, nails the answers with large, properly designed samples. Um, it does seem that for cognitive enhancement uses, you know, people take pills. For recreational use, which students also do, they either take the pill um, and you know use it to go to a party and drink more without getting sleepy, um, or they crush the pills and snort them um, for a kind of faster ramp up of the effect. Um, but that's not cognitive enhancement, clearly. Um, the frequency, you know, is highly variable, but it's often, you know, a handful of times per semester. It's, it's quite intermittent. Um, that's probably, you know, something that people concerned about the safety can take a little comfort in. But really, there's a lot to be learned about this. Um, and uh, particularly if you move off the US college campus. So, you know, do these kids continue to use these drugs as they move into their jobs? Um, what about other countries? There's been a little bit of work. I mean, Canada also um, has a lot of this going on, especially, especially in the more selective um, universities. Um, uh, other countries that have, there's been some research published on Germany, on Australia, um, England. Uh, the, the rates are all lower than the US, as far as people can tell. Um, it also, it looks like it's growing, as far as people can tell. So, um, but what about, you know, what about working people? Well, we know very, very little, at least from uh, kind of systematic research. Um, there's been uh, some polling that's almost, I would say, anecdote collecting rather than anything really scientific um, that shows, uh, that you know, suggests pretty widespread use. This, I think this goes back to, yeah, 2008 now, uh, Nature magazine uh, took a poll asking about opinions, you know, attitudes towards cognitive enhancement and practices. And they found that one in five of their respondents reported using cognitive enhancing drugs. Um, the most common drugs were, I think, methylphenidate, Ritalin, and um, modafinil. Now, I, I just want to caution you not to conclude from that that one in five people do this, or that even one in five nature readers do this, right? These are people who chose to answer a poll about cognitive enhancement. So they are going to be skewed, I think, pretty predictably, toward you know people who find this a very interesting topic, you know, and a very likely reason to find this an interesting topic is that you yourself are doing it. So that's probably an overestimate. Um, there is uh, oh the Vermont ver vacation problem is you know basically if if you uh, you know read in a travel magazine that readers you know that. 30% of readers polled um, like to take vacations in Vermont. I mean, that would be weird. Well, it's because the people who really love to vacation in Vermont are gonna answer that poll, right? So, um, there have been, you know, kind of uh, reader surveys for, um, I think it was Wired, um, asked readers to write in with their cognitive enhancing regimens. <laughs> and they got all kinds of really interesting, in some cases, sort of multi-drug you know, protocols that people use. Um, and these were, these were professionals, you know, business people, attorneys, uh, artists, writers, um, and so forth. So um, it's, it's certainly out there, but you know, really much to be learned about who is actually doing this, how often, why, with what, et cetera. Okay, finally, let us turn to the, um, the LCs, the ethical, legal, and societal issues. So I think the first one, obviously, is safety. Um, and clearly, there is an addiction risk with stimulants. We know that. Um, 
What we don't know, unfortunately, is you know, empirically what is the risk among you know, the sort of typical college student user. Um, uh, people from college health clinics do say they see students who become dependent on these drugs who first got hold of them from, you know, sort of uh, a fellow cognitive enhancers, you know, buying and selling in the dorms and libraries. Um, but uh, there really, there just are no numbers to put on that. Um, and obviously there were other dangers with stimulants in addition to addiction, um, you know, just cardiovascular problems, psychosis, you know, other things that you really don't want. Um, with, um, with modafinil, which has gained a following, again, we don't know exactly what the scope of that following is, um, but people use it not so much for cognitive enhancement, but to, to, um, to get away with less sleep, you know, to pull an all-nighter or whatever, um, and, uh, and feel clearer headed, more energetic, et cetera. Um, there is debate about the addiction potential of modafinil. I think most people would say, well, just looking at the record, you know, looking, looking at the reality, we don't see a lot of modafinil addicts around. On the other hand, there are some research findings that suggest that it could, in fact, have some addictive potential. Um, uh, you know, if you get a rat addicted to cocaine, um, you can then offer it modafinil and it will respond with that kind of compulsive drug seeking for modafinil. So um, anyway, uh, so clearly safety is a big issue. It's not an especially kind of abstract, you know, intellectually interesting issue. Um, uh, it's a pretty straightforward empirical issue, but um, you know, you'd, you'd be remiss not to uh, put it right up there on, on the list. Another issue with a little more um, kind of interesting subtlety, you know, good grist for classroom discussions is fairness. This, this is a Gay and Wilson cartoon. Midway through the exam, Alan pulls out a bigger brain, okay? So is it, is it cheating to use these drugs? Well, some, um, some college honor codes, Duke in fact, um, explicitly say it is a violation of the college honor code to use these kinds of performance enhancing drugs. I don't know how much of an impact that's had, but um, it's certainly taking a, you know, a clear position. Um, this, this is a great topic for discussion that actually I hope afterwards we can um, discuss here. Uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just leave that there for now. In addition to fairness, there's issues of freedom. So in the Army, for example, um, you, you may be um, given uh, Adderall, uh, you know, amphetamine, or modafinil um, to help you perform and help you stay safe uh, under conditions of sleep deprivation. Because, you know, in a combat situation, like if you're in active combat, you can't say, oh, it's 11 p.m., it's bedtime. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's stop and get our beauty sleep. Um, so for, you know, for everybody's safety, the reasoning goes, um, under some conditions, you need to take these drugs. Um, pilots, military pilots, um, I've been told by a couple of people, um, are given uh, doses of amphetamine and modafinil uh, and told to just try them out like on, you know, on days when they're not flying, decide which one works better for them. And that's interesting because there really are individual differences in how people respond to these drugs. And then they use that drug if they're flying on a long mission. Now. Is, are they free to decline? Well, the consent form that uh, a pilot, I think it's in the Air Force, I, maybe it's the Navy, I'm not sure, signs, maybe it's, maybe it's all of the armed forces, um, 
they do give their free informed consent to take this drug, but the consent form specifies that if they opt not to use the drug, their commanding officer may find them unfit for duty. Um, so there's a little, a little pressure there. Um, we can argue about whether it would even be rational to decline, um, given that these drugs do help you maintain awareness and alertness, if not you know, improve your fluid intelligence or working memory capacity. Um, and um, we can also talk about whether you know, perhaps professions other than the military might, might be examples where you would want to defend the practice of forcing people to take these drugs. Um, if you are rushed to the hospital for an emergency middle of the night operation, would you want your surgeon on modafinil? I think I would want my surgeon on modafinil, you know. Um, similarly, you know, long haul domestic uh, airplane travel and, and so forth. Um, okay, that shades into uh, issues of freedom when it's not so clear that um, the, the person's own safety or you know, life and limb of patients or airline passengers are at stake, but rather you know, you're just Sally office worker and um, your boss realizes that he can get more um, productive work out of you per week if you are willing to, you know, pull a weekly all-nighter, then he gets six days a week out of you instead of five. And he says, look, um, you know, you got to do this. We, we have these projects. We have to stay competitive. You know, take, take, take this drug. Or he could more implicitly coerce by saying, you know, uh, Jim and you know Anne are using this drug and it really helps them to be more productive and I really am more inclined to retain and promote productive employees okay so you know will will employees begin needing protection will HR offices have to have policies about the use of um, performance enhancing drugs going into the future. Um, I, I, think, I think we will see that day, you know, in the not too distant future. What about um, professional ethics for the people who prescribe these drugs? Because, you know, Sally, um, the, uh, the troops, they, they are all given these drugs by doctors. Doctors are the gatekeepers right now for these prescription medications. Well, this is something that you'll hear about in detail from Anjan in a couple hours. Um, but you may be surprised to hear that the American Academy of Neurology several days ago, uh, several years ago, this is, I think 2010. Uh, see the, the year on it, I think it's 2010, this will be in the reading packet, um, studied the problem of how should neurologists respond to competent adult patients requesting cognitive enhancement. That is coming to them and saying, look doc, I know I don't qualify for any diagnosis, but I hear there's this great drug modafinil that helps you work longer and smarter, or I hear, you know, amphetamine is going to make it easier for me to focus on my job, so would you prescribe me some? This committee said there is no legal or ethical reason why a doctor should deny that sort of request, um, which I found very surprising. Um, and um, they have followed this up with a, a project, Anjan and I are both involved in it, to develop actual clinical guidelines for doctors to um, prescribe cognitive enhancing drugs, sort of like saying which, which drugs would work best in which patients. Um, we've just been through a huge 
literature review. Um, I don't know what the recommendations are going to be, but I'm guessing they will involve the, um, the caution that, you know, don't expect big boosts in cognition per se. Um, you know, understand and make sure your patient understands that these are, these are boosting other processes, other state variables that may help you get cognitive work done, but it's, it's not really making you smarter. The same organization, American Academy of Neurology, um, just recently, like in the last three or four months, published a follow-up report saying, by the way, where children are concerned, <laughs> this is a whole different story. Um, and that, that, seems, that seems very wise because um, there is a lot of, you know, essentially well, these issues of, you know, freedom come up with kids because it's the parents who are making the decision, possibly pressured by the teachers who want, you know, kind of easy to manage classrooms. Um, so that, that is a, a different um, kettle of fish. Finally, there are these kind of less tangible issues that relate back to the kinds of things that Anam Feaster was talking about um, with uh, sort of Kantian notions of, you know, treating oneself and others as, uh, as ends, not means. Um, here he's, he's uh, you know, trying to move the crank on his brain. He's trying to sh gear shift and he says, Scott, arg. Would you help me please, arg? I'm having trouble arg getting my brain into gear, okay? Well, this idea that we can, we can do better, achieve our goals by essentially treating ourselves like, you know, um, like a, a fancy car whose engine, you know, you can sort of you can lift the hood and sort of tinker with the gears, um, tinker with the machinery, um, is that a little dehumanizing? Is that treating yourself as an object, not a person? Um, I'm not saying it is, but I, I can certainly, I, you know, I, 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 I do feel the pull of that argument, and I, I hope you at least sort of feel the pull of it, that, um, you know, we, we tend to think of ourselves as agents, um, as uh, people who, you know, achieve things in life through our own efforts, and those things are meaningful to us because we got them by our own efforts. And how, how might that be changed if we get them by, um, you know, moving some <coughs> gear shift, by, you know, amping up the levels of some neurotransmitter, um, or by, as, you know, uh, Roy will tell you in a few minutes, by running a little, you know, milliamp or two um, through our brains, uh, it's. Uh, I, I think it's it's an issue that that can be debated and about which there are kind of valid points of view on both sides. Um, uh, you know, similarly, desserts. Um, if somebody gets an A on a test. Uh, or passes their bar exam or whatever, with the help of one of these drugs, um, can they feel quite as proud of themselves as if they did it, you know, just with their own God-given brain? I think some people would feel, no, they couldn't feel as proud. Um, I think other people would say, yeah, look, you know, I, um, take vitamin pills, that makes me better. I wear glasses so I can see what the teacher's writing on the board, that makes me better. This is just one more ingenious way that human beings have of improving themselves. Okay, so that is um, my final slide, and I think I'll leave it up because I think it can um, uh, sort of be a framework for having a discussion about the LCs of cognitive enhancement. Um, I think these are the major bins that these uh, ethical concerns fall into. Um, we can also, if you want, have a first a segment of Q&A about the, the actual cognitive neuroscience of it and then go on to the LCs or do people have just some cognitive questions? Yeah, at least one person does. 
So let's, let's start with that, and then we'll go to Elsie's.